Welcome, folks. This is the um, meeting of the House Corrections and Institutions Committee. Um, we are shifting gears this morning away from <clears throat> corrections budgets and Corona Relief Virus, um, the fund, that fund and that appropriation. We've completed our work there and have submitted our recommendations to House Appropriations Committee. We're now shifting gears to look at racial equity within the Department of Corrections. As we move forward on the House side with two Senate bills uh, that deal with law enforcement, um, the criminal justice system in terms of racial equity and also training with law enforcement. So we feel that corrections is part of the justice system and we are trying to work up some language on how we can proceed here um, within the corrections world. We have today and tomorrow morning at 8.30 to work on listening to testimony from, from folks and particularly from the advocate community and we're having trouble um, getting folks in to testify. I just want to emphasize we are not during our normal legislative session where we have uh, a lot of time to work on issues. This is a real shortened uh, time frame, and our committee is only due to meet today until 10 o'clock and tomorrow morning from 8:30 to 10, and then we're back here next Tuesday and next Thursday and Friday. The issue is we need to get language to the respective committees, be it House Judiciary or House Government Operations Committee to attach that language to the bills that they're working on. The goal is to have the language done by next week, Thursday or Friday, which means we need people to come in and testify. If we don't have people available to come in and testify, we will just do a shot in the dark in terms of language and hope it's okay. And I really don't wanna do that, but we need to move this conversation along. So I hope that we can get folks in tomorrow morning at 8.30 to testify so that we're ready to go with some language next Tuesday. That's my goal. Um, so we can get the ball rolling. Thoughts from members of the committee before we, um, Start taking some testimony. Anyone have any thoughts? Kurt? Uh, is there any way we could do um, what we could sit in on the justice, on the judiciary committee ones? Are they taking testimony that we would be, so that we don't have to have the same person come in twice? We could, the issue is they're not gonna be focusing in on corrections. We could, but they're gonna be focusing in on police force in hmm. law enforcement, they're not going to be focusing in in our world of corrections. We could, but I, you know. Other thoughts? Butch? Uh, Alice, I know uh, Kurt's got a, a great idea there, but I, in this case, we, we I think there's a silo that we need to work in, and I agree with you. Unfortunately, because of uh, events that have happened recently in, in corrections, uh, that we want to get to the bottom of the, the why, and and it's beyond uh, uh, racial disparity. It's it's all kinds of different disparities and equity uh, within the the DOC entirely, D and DOC not just in our incarcerated population, but in our uh, supervised population that's on the street. Uh, I'm. Nobody will come in. I suppose we'll just have to do some sort of enabling language to get the HCI committee in January to move forward with it. Uh, I don't want to take a stab in the dark and hit the wrong target. That's all. I just think it's a missed opportunity if folks don't come before our committee. Absolutely. Uh, this is extraordinary times and, and we need to, to figure this out uh, or at least could start down the road of figuring it out. And I think it's a world that we as a committee live in that whenever people are thinking of the criminal justice system, it's always the front end, it's your law enforcement and it's your courts, and it's DOC that handles those decisions that are made in those two areas. 
and everyone forgets that DOC is part of the criminal justice system. But also DOC, and this is no slam to DOC at all, but when someone's incarcerated, they're in a secure facility and they are not out in the public view. So it's even more important to have some thinking and thoughts in terms of how we approach this. It's not like they're out there when they're supervising folks within a correctional facility. It's not the same as seeing law enforcement out on patrolling your streets or your neighborhood. It's a very different view. And that's not to slam DOC, it's not to slam anyone, it's just the nature of the situation. So I've also had conversations with Bryn Hare about um, how best to approach this with our drafts folks, our legislative council, because Bryn is working with House Judiciary on the use of force uh, legislation. And Betsy Ann Rass is working with House GovOps on the Criminal Justice Training Council. So we've got two different uh, legislative council staff. And in the conversation with Bryn yesterday, she suggested also reaching out to Becky, um, where Becky Wasserman might be able to help us at the beginning to <clears throat> sort of frame our thoughts, help us frame our thoughts, and also start some language um, <clears throat> discussions. And I am going to proceed with having language. We're going to work on language Tuesday morning. That's going to be our schedule, because we've got to get this out to the other committees by the Thursday or Friday of next week. And we only have Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings to meet. So. And Madam Chair, I'll be available. I, I, I had something else scheduled this morning because um, I was told about this a little last minute, but I'll be available tomorrow and Tuesday morning to help. Okay, that'd be great. And we may just have to put words down and then figure out how we go forward. What we're sort of thinking about, Becky, is just having some kind of a report back. Um, I know that Commissioner Baker, when he spoke to us, on Tuesday is really looking for a larger package um, in terms of addressing culture change within corrections. Um, and that's more of a conversation when we get back into our new session in January. But this could lay sort of the groundwork for that, maybe a little bit of the parameters or just start touching the surface of what information would be needed to further from further putting in place the draft for that particular legislation in January. Um, that's sort of the thinking at this point. Okay, anything else? And then we'll move on to Heather here. Okay, Heather, welcome. We haven't Good seen morning. you. We haven't seen you since when? End of January. It's been a bit, <laughs> I've missed you. Yes, and, and now you have a brand new position. Yes, I do. So welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I, I hope you've sort of come into tune with a little bit of what we're talking about and what we're looking at. And um, we've we worked this yesterday, a little bit on Tuesday to try to get some more folks to testify from the advocate community as well as DOC, and you're the spokesperson for DOC at this point. So um, we're just really reaching out to folks to give us some thoughts on what's the best way to approach addressing the issue of racial equity within the culture of corrections. And it would be within the facilities as well as within the field offices. So I'm gonna turn that over for you just so we can start brainstorming. Just jump in. Okay, for the record, my name is Heather Simons. I'm the Director of Office of Professional Standards for the Department of Corrections. And Madam Chair, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, that's a very big question. Uh, and um, I, to your earlier point around 
me being filled in on some of the discussions. I obviously I have been. I've li uh, listened to some of the testimony um, from our from Commissioner Baker, which is not unlike them. It, it's the same message that he's giving our department in terms of um, the overall plan to address culture can't be one area at a time and race race equity and inclusion in the Department of Corrections needs to be um, not just within the facilities, not just the field sites, but also um, how we do business. So that includes the workforce and the efforts that, we, that we're making there. From a, just from um, you know, your basic business plan, it wouldn't look unlike um, police modernization because those, those, those 10 steps really represent the areas of corrections that we want to address and know that we need to, and that includes appropriate needs assessment at the right pace, which I think we, we've we all heard that our community members um, and advocates are uh, advising us that we need to go in a pace at a pace that makes sense, that works, um, and that doesn't cause uh, further chaos. And I think that that, you know, that's certainly one of the challenges for all of us because there's this, we've got a need to fix. And that doesn't necessarily, that urgency doesn't necessarily apply when we have to uh, go at the pace of the people who are harmed. And uh, the race equity work for us um, would include our practices with regards to uh, hiring, that includes interviewing, that includes recruitment. Um, we're understanding that retention is a much bigger discussion. Uh, it's really big, it's more than just retaining somebody, but what it, how are we welcoming people into our department? How are they feeling when they get here? If they're staying, why are they staying? But also their, our workforce experience is critical uh, to the message that they're in turn sending our offender population, whether they're incarcerated or not. But we've got to set a tone if we really are a community that our probation work and um, facilities are an extension of the community. We haven't traditionally done this in the past. We do understand that um, it's additionally critical that we get all of that community feedback. And there are some opportunities for us that I think are distinctly different than other areas. For example, um, families of our uh, the incarcerated, they have a voice. We have a constituency management office now that um, is open and taking uh, calls and emails and responding, which has been one of the most effective ways for us to get a sense of what's the overall sentiment, uh, what are the critical needs, and uh, where are those concerns coming from? Representative Shaw, you referred earlier to, you know, it's not, it's not just the equity work. We really can't do culture work if we don't look at um, equity across the board. Um, uh, abuse of power or the misuse of power. Um, certainly the sexualized work environment, which you've heard plenty from me this winter on, and I think a little bit more from Commissioner Baker, but those are all symptoms and indicators of wellness and we cannot move um, and create, we can't move a culture or create a safer facility if we don't tackle it all. And, and the all part isn't just the recruitment and inclusion, but we have um, uh, set up, um, I'm pausing because again, it, we have to go at the pace at which we're at, but um, our black and brown employees need some affinity, you know, paid space to be able to discuss their experience in the workplace, their experience in their community. I think that uh, um, what we've done, certainly since throughout my career is that we put training on everything. And that's not always uh, the solution that training is um, very useful if we wanna make sure that content is delivered. Training's really useful if we have, a, have to test for a skill. Uh, training isn't always the best answer when it comes to accountability and messaging from the top. Um, uh, leadership practices, um, how we include people, how we welcome people and how we ask for feedback. And I think that that's where the majority of our work is gonna be 
The other things are measurable. We can rewrite policies and certainly we're gonna have some policies to write. But the most important thing is that we are doing a prep, we're doing the proper assessment, which is, has a lot to do with listening. The Office of Professional Standards pretty much has, um, you know, has our metaphorical hands in everything at this point that connects to that. The oversight of the D DOC peer support team, which is the special team set up to support um, employees, particularly around resilience and trauma. Um, COVID hasn't helped with that situation. And so that's an intensely focused team. Um, we all know if we are going to be trauma informed that we can't, we can't do new work until we manage the pain that the current work has caused. Our constituency services office is focused on making sure that we hear from family members and, uh, and any community members. And it's not just um, message received, but there needs to be a loop back in communication. And that's gonna be really important in terms of equity work. We've been working with Tabitha Moore for a few years. She's been regular um, faculty for our leadership training and has delivered a lot of content uh, to us with regards to the, the journey of the white experience. We are mostly white. Um, we, we, the discussions that we need to have really more uh, are less about how we need to change our thinking, but more um, getting comfortable with where we're at, asking questions and creating an environment where people can speak a little more freely, which I think we all know is complicated with, um, with protocols and rules and uh, social media. It's a lot easier to say that we're free to speak, um, but the freedom to feel um, the trust that we need to say what we need to learn, uh, that doesn't come as easily. And that's certainly gonna be and is a focus of the work that we're doing. None of this happens if we don't have um, a healthy protocol and process for our investigations process, right? So on the continuum of things that we have to pay attention to, it's full realization that uh, people are still being harmed. Folks need to be accountable. We need to be really, we need to get very comfortable with how we define um, misconduct and what that means and uh, creating avenues where reporting is easier. And at the very least understanding um, what is the comfort level for not just, not the workforce, but also our offender population to say what they have to say. Additionally, the um, language in this area becomes so important we don't always have the language to describe what's happening to us. And so um, it's easier to dismiss someone if they're in pain, if they can't, if we can't put language to what we're going through, then maybe we won't say anything. And I think that, that that's gonna be one of our biggest challenges is finding ways to create the space where anything can be shared so that we can dive into whether it's uh, what the actual issue is. We don't wanna be a culture that creates so much fear around reporting that we're not learning, if that makes sense. I'm gonna stop you there, Heather. Um, to me, that really hits a nerve in terms of having fear around reporting. I think that may really be one of the crux of the issue. Can you expand a little bit on what that fear might be? And I think it would be different if it's reporting a situation from an, an offender reporting something or a staff person reporting something. I mean, to me, that's really hitting a core of this discussion for yeah. what's entailed. I mean, can you give us some examples at all of some of those situations? Um, I don't want to point fingers at anybody, but I just want to get a handle on a more of that statement, the fear of reporting something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, 
it's probably easier if I start, you know, if I make it clear as we move through whether I'm talking about workforce or um, or the or the people that we serve. But one commonality is is it's the fear of retaliation. What what happens to the quality of my life if I say something? And that um, that experience is going to be different whether you're an employee or you're incarcerated or under supervision. But ultimately, the, feels, the fear is around someone or some people having control over my destiny because I've voiced something. That, um, I don't think that that varies too much. Um, being able to recognize uh, someone else's experience when we haven't experienced it ourselves, I think that's the complexity of this, right? So. We want to make sure that when we supervise offenders that we're being fair, that we're following the rules. Well, corrections is deeply rooted in rules that um, if you go, you don't have to go too far back to see that those rules were inhumane. And so our, our duty to continue to be vigilant around, is it best practice? Is it current? And just because it's a rule doesn't mean that it makes sense. That's one. Two is, the quality of understanding what somebody is saying to us when they make a complaint, because I might not have the same experience. And I know we, um, we often hear and use uh, the term microaggressions, right? Those are the little things that add up that um, that's, uh, they're, they're hard to, um, it's kind of hard to prove. And sometimes it's even hard to justify internally. So I think um, an easy, you know, I think an easy one for women over years, we've said, we know when we're not being called on in a meeting, <laughs> it's not exactly, you know, it's not exactly a felony, but we experience over time um, a marginalization. You can't put your finger on it. You can't prove it, but uh, the pattern develops and um, even explaining it is very difficult because the process of explaining um, could possibly make me sound like I'm just not getting attention or I'm a troublemaker. It's those kinds of examples that if my audience hasn't had the same experience, may not understand the impact of it. And uh, where that becomes critical is when I live, if I live my life from, from my lens and someone else, um, has said to me that what I'm doing is making them feel bad or affecting their liberty or their safety, and I can't see it, it's gonna be harder for them to put language to it. I think that uh, um, the basic places to look in this in our, in our facilities would be, how do we tr traditionally see um, grievances and sanctions? How do we use them? And what is the reason for that? And uh, data is gonna be critical in terms of how we move through this process and connect those dots. For the workforce, we look at things like promotions. That would be the easiest place to start. There are a number of nuances that go along with that, but I think you know the, the demographics around who's in what position and what we value as skills is part of this assessment around equity. And corrections is a place where we, you know, we have cultivated a certain po uh, profile, which makes very practical sense. If you come into corrections as an officer, the, we'll likely be looking at, you know, it makes sense to go from law enforcement to corrections or military to corrections. That's an area where it's where traditionally it just we have connected the dots because that's what we've always done. But the mission of corrections work is different. And the skills that we bring in and value might not be as relevant. I'm not saying they're Ill, irrelevant, but reprioritizing how we see confinement as the purpose of confinement security. Um, is, the, is the competency of use of force more important than de-escalation or recognizing or being more culturally aware or cult culturally competent? So Heather, I'm gonna stop you there because we have a couple of committees members that have some questions, but this is, I, I think the other piece that is really resonating with me is what is the mission of corrections? And is it the same as law enforcement and the military? And I think that's a piece that really 
we can vet a little bit where corrections by our state policy in our statutes as corrections is for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, and law enforcement and military is for security. And sometimes those two work hand in hand with rehabbing and sometimes it doesn't with rehabilitation. So that, those are the simple thoughts in my mind. Uh, so we have a couple questions, Sarah and then Kurt. So Madam Chair, I, some of my questions you, you've kind of stated, um, but, but Heather, it's really nice to have you here and congratulations on this is a new title or new position you have. I'm, I'm, Thank um, you. Yeah, congratulations. And I'm Thank excited. Good morning. To, um, and I think where we're coming from and where we could use your guidance for, um, is I think these these issues are intertwined, like changing the culture within corrections, you know, have a, 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 a work for, a, improve a working environment, um, you know, building a high quality workforce, you know, retaining officers and training are all, are all intertwined. Um, and I guess, you know, I think with this short session, we're not going to be inventing what that training or what that looks like. I think this, this step is about how, you know, what, ki what kind of resources you might as a um, agency need to go deeper and to come back to us with some recommendations. So, um, you know, when I heard that we were, that we were thinking about doing this work, I started to poke around, you know, on the internet. And I, I mean, there's, there's been some research done, um, national research and um, uh, regional research about how to do this work. So I guess my question is from your perspective as the direct, the Office of Professional Standards, like within that purview, what, you know, what are the tools that you need us, that you would need to do this work to come back to us with um, kind of a package or recommendation of how to how to affect, affect change? Like, do you need to an outside entity to work with you, or do you feel like you have the resources internally to to do this kind of a report? Sorry for the long winded question, but no, that's okay. It's helpful. Thank you. Um, I, you know, a hard yes on all outside consult. This is an area where um, pretending like we we don't know what we don't know, and that's sort of why we're in this boat, right? We, um, and there's plenty of research and um, an enormous number of consultants, um, not just in Vermont, but across the country in terms of how to begin this conversation and balance that with, balance that with the measurables. And um, whether it's uh, community members who will lead, I mean, you know, the best assessment we can have about how we're doing are the people we're affecting. And I think um, the community focus for us is going to be and is critical and not just in the traditional areas, not just you know the call to the commissioner's office. They need to be included in focus groups and facilitation around those groups um, needs to be done strategically and thoughtfully with the right people and um, resources with regards to how we do that. It's gonna be really important. Um, the, the talent and stamina to, to build a learning organization around areas of the affective realm is not easy. And so again, I think thoughtfulness is really important, understanding the amount of discretion that Corrections has. We know, you know state's attorneys have, um, uh, they have the power, right? They have all the power in terms of um, the front end of this and law enforcement has discretion, Corrections, has the opportunity to determine the quality of somebody's sentence. And um, we are in a critical place with the support of this committee, uh, with the public sentiment, and with the demand from the public and the community to make some change, to really use the voices who have pushed us in this direction to assist us in getting where we need to go. I don't know. Um, you, you know that you know. I like to talk about training. I think uh, I'm always worried that training is going to get cut before other what are considered more essential services. But this is an area where training isn't everything, and we can't we can't always measure the level of trust that someone has. But we can build it, and we can see the we can see the product on the other end. We've underestimated the power of the uh, um, 
of, of listening. And that is, that's a place where we can formalize that process, whether it's the grievance process in the facilities or creating new systems where we're inclusive on our policies. For example, Tabitha Moore is um, assisting us um, in the rewrite with our use of force policy. What we get bogged down in traditionally is wanting to get the job done, get the product finished, and we lose sight of outside vision on things we need to see. There's so much that we can do to, um, up front. I think you've heard Commissioner Baker talk about body cameras, for example. <clears throat> um, when we, most folks, when they think of body cameras, they think about accountability and being able to see what happened. Um, one of the terrific opportunities around body cameras is that it's also going to capture the enormous amount of terrific work that's happening. It's very hard for us to measure what we've de-escalated. So in terms of resources, that's an area where it would be un it's, it wouldn't be something that I normally think of in the role of uh, Office of Professional Standards because that's around pushing culture and standards and not really around equipment. But body cameras are a vehicle to see all the great work, to see the evidence of terrific, of terrific training, to um, understand the complexities of a really good de-escalation. We don't know how many suicides we prevent because we've prevented them. We don't know how many people we have calmed down and, re and redirected who have a more optimism than they did the day before because they, because they have done what they needed to do and there's no, we only see the bad stuff, right? So that, that is probably one um, that the resources around equipment is much more um, useful than we're used to thinking because we're so accountability driven. I also think that could go a long way with regards to building public, public trust, which is really, really the goal here outside of um, safe um, facilities and supervision with dignity. Anything else, Sarah? Okay, so we have more questions. Kurt, Butch, and Carl. Uh, I think uh, Representative Coffey articulated my question very well. I, I'm, I, I'd like to think that we and the DOC are both aiming in the same direction. We're wanting to do the same thing. So my question is kind of the same as, as Sarah's. What can we do to help? What sorts of things do you need or language that you need or ability that you find you don't have that we could be able to provide through any um, language of legislation and things like that? That's my question. And some of it you've, you've kind of talked about, but it would be really good if we had um, some specifics as to where you see uh, the kind of help that we could give in, in reaching the goals that we're both looking for. There were DOC and the legislature. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, that's a great question. Um, For instance, do you, do you have the, the tools to measure the things that you say that we would like to measure in order to um, know if we're doing a good job? Do you have the resources to do that? Uh, as far as outside consultants, you mentioned a lot of there, that there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, is there some difficulty in getting them on board and getting their information so that you can um, process what they what they have? So I so it would be so easy for me to say you know money money and positions right that that is I know that's not what you're asking um, I'm hesitating because uh, I don't want to speak for my commissioner but the the resources again I think. Um, for us, our uh, access to the subject matter experts so that we're not recreating the wheel. Um, that um, the uh, person power to collect data and do it in a thoughtful way so that we are capturing what, not just what we want to capture, but making sure that, um, making sure that we have the time and the space 
um, to attach the data to the to the mission is what we are is what we're collecting um, going to get us where we want to go. Uh, resources around um, well, first of all. Um, this isn't lip service, but the opportunity to have this discussion today is, a cons I mean, it's incredibly supportive and putting on the record that this is valued, that corrections hasn't been lost in the mix, that this is, um, you know, we are um, a very critical uh, part of the criminal justice system. Um, this committee has um, a deep understanding of every area that corrections goes in from um, the incarcerative experience, certainly now COVID mitigation for our state, restorative justice practices, hotel management. We're, co we're covering it in terms of our ability to impact the community. I think for, for resources, mm -hmm. it would be around how we include the community and what's it gonna what's it gonna take, particularly now when finding space, even space to meet. The experience of meeting um, is challenging. Uh, COVID's not helping that, and um, vehicles like platforms like Zoom certainly assist and are bringing us together. But we're talking we're talking about basic contact theory and the work we have to do face to face, which we know um, is at the heart of healing and change and reform. So I'm not dancing around your question. It's just that I haven't thought of it yet. What, what would we need to, to fill that gap given that we don't know how long we're in this situation? That's- yeah. <clears throat> Well, there, there's nothing wrong with, with saying uh, money in positions. Those are legitimate requests if those are legitimate needs. I mean, if, the, if there's a position that you think uh, the legislature should be funding that is, would really help in this sort of a situation, then there's nothing wrong with pointing that out to us. The, if if you, you mentioned access to, um, I think you mentioned access to uh, consultants or outside information, is there something that's keeping you from getting that? Or do you find that you don't have the time to, to, to uh, get that information? Or is there something else? No, we are, we are, we have, uh, we currently have a contract with Lori Gurney who does clinical oversight for our peer support team. We know um, being able to um, support not just the peer support team at our command center and doing decompressions. Um, we're building a more resilient workforce, but there's a lot of history and trauma there. So that, and that is, um, uh, that's not separate and apart to race and equity work because we do race and equity work because harm has been done. So that's one contract that's in place. Um, Tabitha Moore, um, who you know is the director of the NAACP um, has just come on with us. Uh, we've been talking to the Moss Group um, and uh, they're gonna be assisting us with uh, building our mission and vision. Uh, there's an enormous amount of work additionally that I think that um, needs to be done if we're going to make sure that we move. One of my concerns around resources is this. If we just address one section of the department, we're creating potentially more pain for another. So if, we're all, if we are only creating space for the offender population, the workforce is not, is not getting the support the workforce needs. If we start with one office and not another office, if we begin only top down, um, because the, of the importance of messaging, then bottom up is left feeling like this is only important in one area. So the bigger picture on resources is how much can we do at one time and how much is that gonna be? And I'm referring to things like contracts. Okay, thank you. And positions and money. Butch and then Carl. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Heather, nice to see you again. Uh, see you, Representative. Yeah, you know, you've uh, put a lot of snippets out this morning, uh, and we had a conversation yesterday with the commissioner yesterday, I think. Tuesday. Uh, yeah, one of those days uh, <laughs> that when we talked about this a little bit and, and we talked about training, uh, and you brought it up again this morning and saying, and I 
we all made the statement or agreed that training new new people is way easier than training existing employees because of the culture that the existing employees have been been working in. And it's it's encouraging to uh, hear you talk about uh, race and gender equity in hiring and, re and, and recruiting. Uh, that's good luck with that. Uh, that's diff a difficult piece. But I hear a couple of things a lot from uh, the uh, the line, I'll call them the line employees uh, of the department. And you talk about writing and correcting, bringing up to date policies and getting rid of agent policies that no longer apply and reflect today's circumstances. But I can hear in my mind, I can hear the long time, longer time employees and it filters down to the newer employees. This is just another BS component <laughs> central office. Mm -hmm. And we hear that all the time. And I wish uh, we could find out a way to help you get by that particular uh, statement. And every time something goes sour, we hear that statement and willing to try to help figure that out. And I have no idea how to get by that. And I don't know that you even you have an answer for that, but it just maybe you could comment on that, Heather. I've, there's some obvious, um, the easy go-tos on that is that the reality around uh, transitioning leadership. It's very difficult to create steadiness when le when there is constant uh, transition with regards to leadership. That's an that's an easy go-to, and I'm sure not shocking. Um, there isn't a department that I've worked with um, that includes my na national colleagues uh, that doesn't have the same conversation around the mistrust of headquarters um, and how that impacts everyone uh, in the field or on the line. That said, um, in, in many regards, uh, this is a um, much deserved reputation and that's not easy to say, uh, but it is. And uh, with regards to um, this committee's uh, offer to, to assist, I, I think any, any opportunity that we have to fully understand, particularly with uh, Commissioner Baker, has opened up the can of worms in every area, right? That's a testament to um, how we can't do one thing at a time. We can't just focus in one area. So if we focused only on recruitment, that doesn't do much for attrition. For example, we can keep bringing people in, but if the quality of their experience doesn't change, they're not going to stay. If um, we don't rec if we don't create a work environment that says you're welcome here and you're welcome to speak your mind. Um, we're not gonna. We're not gonna go to the. We're not gonna go to the next step in terms of building capacity to have the leadership that has the stamina that's going to keep. Um, that's going to create a leadership climate that says this is the. This is what our mission is. Additionally, around um, it's trust, right? If my when people say it's just lip service from central office, the underlying message in my in my opinion is I don't trust them or if there's change, I haven't experienced it. And one way to experience change um, from the top down is you've got to, it's got to show up in your day-to-day, -day, your day-to-day -day experience. Putting out an email doesn't necessarily affect someone's um, job description. It's a message. Um, changing a policy um, may let people know what the rules are now but it may not um, affect the way someone feels. And I think that that en employee engagement, it's measured in a number of different ways. Uh, the Department of Human Resources puts out surveys every year to ask people what their experience is. That's an area where I think we need some more, we need more support and expertise. What are the, what questions, the questions we're asking need to in some way match the goal we're trying to get at. And uh, 
when we follow an employee from the beginning, for example, mm -hmm. from recruitment through your whole career and ask the same questions, we're gonna get a sense of why people stay or leave or why they report or not report or even why they're terminated. All of that is, me saying that isn't gonna change um, a probation officer's day to day. It's, it's, it's my thinking around the next best um, plans, but it won't necessarily change um, CO Jones's experience at a facility or a probation officer's um, experience in the field. And so that concept of we have to put our money where our mouth is, is gonna take some time and we need to show some evidence of, of the experience we're trying to see. And that can't happen in just one area. It also okay. can't happen too fast. So I, I, I agree and I look forward to working with you on this, I hope, in January, I hope, I hope. Uh, but uh, we have to, we as legislators tell you to do a lot of things. And so you take the brunt of our suggest no of things we tell you to do and so you guys take the brunt of that and that has to be trans i think that has to be transmitted to your to to, to the uh, line employees that it's not always central office's fault uh, but the other piece that i've come to learn over the years is you run a, a large company if mm -hmm. you take it to the to the uh into the private sector with 1,100 employees or something like that. If, 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 that, if you were a standalone company, we would be throwing money at you to get you to stay here <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you run a large company and every time that there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a budget problem, it seems to me that the legislature goes to corrections. And I think about that on some past actions that have happened, we built we borrowed money from corrections a few years back to do some office, some, some building work in St. Albans. We borrowed it from corrections. And I don't, I'm not sure, Alice, you'll have to help me. I don't know if we ever, we paid you back or not. But we was, got paid back. But yeah, but it was big money. It was uh, big money. It was millions. Yeah. So yeah. that's a culture that we have to change within the legislature to give you the support you need. And uh, that's something we can work on on our end, I think. Thanks, Heather. And thank you all. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Carl? Uh, thanks, Alice. Good morning, Heather. Nice to, nice to see you, and thanks for joining us um, for another one of these conversations that we have. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, I, I know that we've talked a lot uh, with you and with others about um, hiring, training, supervision, and culture. Um, and, but you, you raised the grievance policy and, and issues around that. And I know that hiring and training and supervision feed into that. Um, but it's, that's also one of those places where um, a lot of trust can be lost and there's certainly opportunities for any sort of bias or inequity, inequity to be um, amplified within that process. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit more about what your vision for that is, and I'm not talking, I, mean, I don't mean so much in that how people use it, but all, but how it's applied. And is there, are there changes that need to be made there that, um, that we need to be thinking about too? And to Does be clear, sense? yes, as long as I, my understanding the grievance process for our offender population and how that affect, affects the department and the workforce. Well, there's, <clears throat> there's really two pieces there. There's the um, grief, and I know I understand this is fraught with issues around labor too. Um, but there's the there's the internal there's the offender there's the offender piece, and then there's the employee piece. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, the employee piece, I think. Um, would it just so, one thing we know with regards to our attrition rates is um, some people are sometimes leaving because of the experience they're having at the work site. And that's not necessarily attached to central office, though it may be indirectly. 
So for example, if central office determines that, um, you know, mandatory overtime, then that's not really, that, that's not really gonna lend itself to the responsibility of the work site. What we do know is that the quality of the experience between the employee and the supervisor and their colleagues uh, means more than most um, in terms of inspiration and willingness to attend training and um, a stick to uh, to understand the larger mission. All of this in turn is gonna um, affect someone's um, stamina around uh, seeing uh, the supervision practices differently. So when, when law enforcement, for example, talks about fair and impartial policing, what we're talking about is fair and impartial supervision. And as you know, it's been a long road for law enforcement to um, fully understand how to even measure that experience. That the complexities around, again, it's around rules. So when you're breaking the law and, and you're pulled over, are you pulled over for a specific reason or are you pulled over because uh, you're breaking the law and how that gets dissected and evaluated and then in turn um, addressed through training and policy takes some time. So to your point around the grievance process, which is what we need to get a better understanding of the experience of the offender if they have a grievance. If they're making a complaint, um, there's the complaint itself, then there's uh, how, is it, uh, how does it lend itself to um, the rules around what they can say is a complaint, and then what is the experience around that actual complaint? So if it's, um, um, medical slips, or I didn't get the, you know, I didn't get the food that I wanted, or um, I, the mail that I know I was supposed to receive, I didn't get the, that, those are the measurables, but getting to the part where why does this keep happening to the same person? If the same person in the same grievance or the same officer in the same grievance, and we can't make assumptions about the officer either. Sometimes this, if it's the same officer getting a lot of grievances, it might be the same officer doing what they're supposed to be doing all the time. So I'm not making assumptions about what direction that goes in. The quality of the training is gonna be around how we measure cooperation and how much can we do before we get to a grievance? How much do we need to do before we get to the part where people are complaining or going out, um, now I'm talking about the workforce, what, what can we do to get in front of the employee experience before they're taking so much sick time? You can't, we don't know if they're actually sick or they don't wanna come to work. Those are the topics where um, not everything, not, when I say not everything is training, that, that may not be a training issue, but that's a management issue in terms of what's happening in the workplace, but the content around the training again becomes critical and that is, what do we value? How do we use the complaint system? What are we trying to measure? And what's the interaction between employees and uh, the population we serve, even during that process? How do we handle, you know, how do we give someone the paperwork to make a complaint? How does that even, is that a respectful interaction? If, am, I, if, am, I, um, am I using eye contact? Am I looking for further information? All of those things can be incorporated into the way we do business. But what we haven't done in the past is really get a handle on the nuances on the lower end. And I think that's gonna come in with um, that data collection. I can see how the data collection and the training supervision hiring piece would help a lot, a lot with this. But I, I also think there's there's some real challenges in having a, 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 a command and control department in the agency of human services and <laughs> how, you know, how it's, it's that, that piece that I'm, I'm constantly reminded of and that dichotomy and, and the complexity of that, that issue and the culture around that too. Um, and how, how do we get at that to have better outcomes for everyone? Not just, not just our, um, our, our inmates, but all, and when they eventually leave, but also um, staff and CEOs and everyone else all the way up to uh, the front office. So, all right, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, Heather. Thank you, I hope I answered some of the question. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a, we could have a long conversation about that, but we don't, don't necessarily have the time, so thanks. Okay.
That will be in January, <clears throat> for sure. January. Uh, Sarah? Sure, thanks. Um, this is kind of, a, I hope, a brief, a short question. What What is the existing training for staff on, you know, but what I would call bias training? So that can be mm -hmm. in, inclusive of, um, you know, racial bias, gender bias, um, all, all of that. And, well, and where, we have, and it's, well, we just did our work on the budget. Um, it's not a very uh, detailed, we don't get down to the granular level. How much um, do you have with training? So I, I, the training I'm talking about is after people come through the academy and like what's the professional development um, training that, that folks are expected to continue on and I, um, that's an area where we really are going to need to grow and uh, those basic competencies that you refer to at the academy that's where it gets captured and there's a, there's a number of hours um, after that it falls under our competency or our stipe, uh, our stipend program but we don't have mandatory what we um, what I think some agencies called diversity training or cultural competence. It's been built into other areas. Um, it's incorporated into various topics that we already deliver, but a hard and fast um, equity, race and equity training program that I could say is you know 40 hours is not across the board. And we've only barely gotten there in terms of our uh, leadership training, which uh, covered a great, pretty much was the focus of the week, but that's, uh, that's a capacity building program. That is, um, I think we, we've got about 75 folks that have been through that in a, in a, a few years, and that is not um, representative of where we need to go in terms of that content. The, um, depending on your job class, you may or may not have much, a lot more of uh, those conversations. So certainly if you're uh, working in the restorative justice areas of the department. I can't tell you how many hours or what the specific content is, but it's quite a lot more than you would have access to if you were a CO, for example. Um, field managers have a lot more latitude in terms of who they bring in to speak or what or how or when and how those folks go to training. But again, I'm, I think you're asking a more standard question if I'm correct. And I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I, I, most of it is education, understanding what folks have access to. Now, it sounds like if you're a CEO, you don't actually have access to a lot of this uh, training, nor is it required, currently required. Right, it's, it's built into, um, I mean, there is, there's cultural competence training um, that includes, um, Workforce coordinators, that includes discrimination, um, sexual harassment, uh, LGBTQ training, um, pathways and profiles, or um, pathways and profiles is the, um, the content where we discuss um, the incarcerative experience and how one might get there. And it really does get to things like bias in terms of how we judge the people that we serve. So I don't want to sell us short in terms of the discussions and the content, but at the same time, we have so much more to do. Currently, well, I can, one thing that's been uh, very useful recently is letting, the fo is letting the group steer us a little bit. So Tabitha Moore, for example, has come into a number of meetings uh, with the basic framework that we were gonna begin discussing things like um, a, you know, a person's personal journey, um, res um, restorative efforts, um, what bias means. What people really want to know about is what's going, is what their work experience is in relation to what's happening right now. So what do we mean when we say defund police? What does Black Lives Matter really mean to you and to me and to my colleagues? And how do I um, develop the skills to even manage that conversation? Uh, what, are, what are the dynamics and nuances around the fact that it often seems like Black Lives Matters is versus Blue Lives Matters? Those are all very important discussions that I haven't asked my staff or any consultant to attach. There's no test for that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to measure that experience for someone because really what it is, it's the space to trust to start 
talking. And given that, you know, corrections is, um, it's, it's a partnership in law enforcement, right? So there's gonna be a lot, a lot of uh, real feelings around um, what that means in relation to what's happening in the community. In addition to that, uh, for our black and brown employees, what is their experience as they supervise black and brown offenders? What does that mean to them? Understanding what structural racism is um, globally is different than having to work in our department and abide by the rules and protocols of a department that may or may not align with either one, your individual experience or your opinion about the way things should be. Does that make sense? Thank you, Heather. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's partly us understanding, you know, the structures and, of, of, you know, and the educational programs and training that you do that will help us, I think, put language in that doesn't, that, that, that helps us reach this goal, not that doesn't trip you up. So, um, so thank you. It's, this is, this is very helpful. Thank you. Much more to, there's much more to do. Mm -hmm. So we have another question, Butch. Thanks. Uh, Heather, you just mentioned structural racism. And I guess I don't know exactly what that means. Um, can you help me learn about that a little bit? Because that may be a place where we can launch some language from. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm the person that should be speaking to it. Um, what, I, what, I, what I mean when I say it in terms of the work we have to do is um, that the system itself, the criminal justice system itself has set up um, to be racist. And this, we know this. And those intercept points as someone enters into the criminal justice system um, start far before incarceration, hence the term pipeline, right? And then of course, um, the experience of someone post-incarceration, meaning the stigma that we carry after we serve a sentence or we're under supervision. What does that mean in terms of being able to get um, a job um, or a loan? I think that, um, the uh, pretty much opening the can of worms on that conversation for the Department of Corrections is being able to let our guard down, um, uh, to open our eyes and to really fully admit that the prison system period really comes from um, a racist perspective and that our original prisons from the South mm -hmm. built on plantations. And that is a very rich history of punishment, of failure, you know, imbalance of power, and we don't have to go that far back. I'm a little hesitant, Representative Shaw, to go much further because there's so many more people much, so much smarter than me that could speak to this in a thoughtful way. But for, for planning purposes where I sit, it's really about acknowledging the whole thing. Well, as, as the chair said, when we started, we're trying to develop some, excuse me, develop some language that we can build on uh, in the next session. Uh, and because we don't want to lose our place where we are today. And you just made a very, very, you just made a very strong statement that said cr criminal justice system is set up to be racist. Mm -hmm. We need to get, we need to get to the bottom of that. We're not going to get to the bottom of that certainly today, but we need to figure out what that means. And, and I hope we can, and we may be able, I don't know what else, we may be able to incorporate that in into, uh, into some language. Thank you. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking a variety of things here um, and it may be good for us to spend the next 15 minutes or so just to see what we're all thinking that we need to encompass within the language. Um, we have another question, Kurt. Uh, yeah, uh, Butch, I think you've raised a very good point um, and I'd like to pursue it. And Heather, you said that uh, there are other people who could speak a lot better about this. Do you have some suggestions that people we could bring in who might be able to better uh, tell us about the structural racism in the judiciary system? 
Well, um, yes, I think you mentioned all of their names right before we started this morning. Um, oh. Certainly Director Davis, um, Tabitha, who's been working with us a little bit, Eitan, um, um, Bor Yang, um, as any, any of a number of the national consultants associated with the Moss Group. They're doing a lot of equity work um, across the country. Uh, that, I'm trying to think. Um, uh, it would be good if there was somebody who's knowledgeable about Vermont's uh, corrections and judiciary system also, mm -hmm. which I, you mentioned several that are actually, so that helps. Yeah, Curtis Reed as well. Okay. And, uh, and collaboratively, I think, you know, we're, prepa we're prepared to start, you know, we're prepared to participate in this language and we've been doing, um, we've been doing our homework around this. I think for us, it's uh, how do we put, you know, what's the, what's the timeline look on this? Uh, where do we start? Um, and that's, when I say that, I don't mean that we haven't started, but in terms of being able to bring you product that looks a lot like a schedule and some content, um, that's going to be more than just training topics that we're talking about a shift in uh, practices across the board. Okay. So <clears throat> I just want to open this up now. We've got like 15, 20 minutes for the committee to really think about what some of the language we need to put together. Um, so while you're thinking that, I'm gonna ask Heather another question. Heather, a lot of policies and protocol that occurs within DOC is done through your directives. Mm -hmm. How, I'm assuming that a lot of what we are talking about here will require really looking at your directives and bringing those into line with what we're speaking of. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's gonna be a heavy lift. Very. How many directives total do you have? How many hundreds? <laughs> I don't know. I wanna take a stab at it, but I'll, I'll get in trouble. I'll get yeah. it so wrong. I think there's the number that we have, the number that we don't need, and the number that we need to fix. And I could get you the answer to all of those. But if I think I understand your, your point, it's around um, not so much writing another direct, directive on race and equity, but how are we changing the way we do business so that it's clear that we've addressed race and equity in our use of force directive. It's clear that it's um, that our uh, de-escalation training um, and our behavior continuum reflects the work that we're doing in this area, um, and what, whether it's security practices or supervision practices or grievances or reporting or investigations. If, if I'm hearing you, that's what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that said, that's that's um, that's equal, if not more, amount of work because it's taking something we've done, undoing it, and then and then messaging, messaging a new way of doing things. And then once that has occurred, where the protocol is now different because the directive is different, how does that get translated to current line staff? Because um, in the past, that has been an issue that sometimes it was just done during what was called roll call. Mm -hmm. There was oh. no formal way of updating the correctional officers in terms of what has changed. Is that practice still in place or is it done differently? Well, um, I'm pausing because, you know, COVID has changed our lives in terms of messaging. In some ways, it's freed us up to um, get together more often, but not obviously not in person. Uh, roll calls still happen. 
I think um, I'd ha you know, I really would be looking to my, to our facilities exec, Al Cormier and the commissioner and our security folks to support what I say. I, I think they would agree with me that roll call is a short period of time and that's a place for updates, not a place to change minds. And um, uh, to, again, um, not to put, you know, not to put all the emphasis on training. I think when we change um, the way that we experience meetings or, or um, message from the top down, that's gonna be critical too. Um, <laughs> excuse me, to your point around how does it get to line staff? Um, often, it's got to be often. We can't, we cannot assume that when we say something or do something, announce something or implement something that it's, it's, we just need to say it once. And I, you know, I often think that that's lost on us because it, once I say it, it's off me. We're so busy and we're so overwhelmed that um, I think internally we just sort of decide, okay, if we finished it and we push it in this direction, it's now embedded and that's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. The commitment from, um, our, from central office to make sure that we're pulling in um, leadership from all the work sites, this is one area where I was, you know, I'm pretty optimistic about this shift is that there's no more, you know, there's no driving to meetings right now, which allows for us to have more conversations. What, whether any, nobody wants more meetings, so I'm not saying that but there isn't anything getting in the, there shouldn't be a misunderstanding because um, we all, you know, for the most part, we all have access to, the, to this platform. That challenge doesn't go away for line staff in a facility. It's not, you can't just hop on a meeting. Uh, many of the, our uh, field and facility staffs, um, even if they do have access to computers, don't have cameras. So um, work, doing work in the affective realm becomes really hard. But um, we'll, we'll have to, we're going to have to be, that's a marathon, for me, that's the marathon, not the sprint in terms of this work. Then additionally, it's accountability for us that when we message um, that we're, that we, that there's a loopback mechanism for knowing message received and being practiced. And that's going to require um, a considerable commitment from um, not just from central office, but from management in general, and then structure set up to see that. So we have another question and then I wanna shift gears into the committee really brainstorming about what language uh, we'd like to include. And Phil just reminded me we have until 10.30 today, not 10 o'clock, sorry. So Kurt? Uh, yes, Commissioner Baker has mentioned a couple of things. One was um, the centralization of hiring uh, or recruiting. Mm -hmm. And also he said the next uh, training class that's going through in October will be significantly different in terms of how they're selected and how they're vetted and things like that. Can you, has that changed uh, or how's that changed with the centralization of recruiting going and what sort of, uh, changes was he talking about for the next class of, of CO trainees? Great, so, thank you. So the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, so the whole experience for the last few academies has been different because of social distancing and the number that we can allow into, um, into the academy. And it's, a con it's condensed so that we're focused only on um, the essential competencies We'll have to go back and um, revisit training for all of these folks, but it's we really were just it was risk mitigation for us in terms of uh, in-person contact. When the commissioner referred to the October class, that's the last class um, uh, that he's approved in order for us to. Um, keep moving with a change in what you call the standardized or centralized hiring practices. Those practices are being developed right now by our recruitment office. And that is um, what we mean by standardized is that we, uh, we will not take away um, power uh, from any of the work sites, but more that we need to know, um, we're all gonna be asking the same questions. 
and uh, I don't believe that that's you know happened. We've had some consistency over the years, but just basic interview questions for every facility should be the same, so that they would be scored from the perspective that um, if you could, if you were hired, you could work anywhere. Background checks, um, as you know, we haven't taken the dive we should, and so those processes are getting put in place right now in terms of. Um, what we're looking for, but how we're looking into uh, work history um, and history in general references. And um, again, this won't be, we're not trying to cookie cutter this from any other agencies. I know that there are some things about us that are a little different. We get a lot of young people that come work for us. So they may or may not have five or six years of experience before they come in. We also have folks that are transitioning from the military at way too young an age, if you ask me, but still very young. And so um, we're again, working with Tabitha and how we set the framework for uh, interview questions that capture integrity, uh, openness to diversity, resilience, um, which is a little more, that gives us some, a little more latitude than say your, um, your, your last three jobs, for example. Um, and we're also we're also uh, researching um, other uh, assessment tools. And for example, I think the state police uses the MMPI, which is psychological testing. But we're committed to um, looking at all avenues where we can get a sense of someone's fit for uh, the kind of work that corrections is right now, which is much more than just security. Down the the, I understand the, um, the Harvard implicit association test is controversial, but um, have you thought of using that to test implicit bias in, in the, any recruits? We have, and everything's on the table. We used it for our first leadership class. Um, that um, I think that is one of a number of areas that the recruitment team is looking at in terms of um, assessment and um, even, you know, um, entrance exams, that's not off the table either. But I think what we want, you know, we, we want to be open to the fact that um, not all, not all testing and not all exams are, are relevant either, right? So when we're testing, what are we, what are we testing for? Yeah, but that, that, that one in particular would be interesting to see over time if, if, the, if, uh, uh, a CEO took it at the at the uh, during training and then took it after a couple of weeks on the job and then took it after every year just to see how things develop with that uh, responses develop. But anyway, okay. okay. I Thank think you. they take it at the police academy. Huh. I think they do. So we have another question, Sarah. Thanks. I, I'm just. I'm responding to the question you asked, Alice, about like what we're thinking mm -hmm. about some of this. Is that appropriate now? Like to, because um, I'm thinking, I know we all kind of want to get down to what the action steps should be here, but I, my sense is that we're looking at almost like asking for the department to, to do a, um, come back to us with a, a series of recommendations. Like, so, um, and I'm hearing things around the topics of that training is one of them, but also the grievance process. Um, um, to me, it might be helpful to see, to, to also have you share like where this, um, where the different kinds of training um, and competencies exist within the DOC's professional development. Um, it sounds like you're already doing some really good stuff with Tabitha Moore um, and um, she's pretty amazing. And um, I'm wondering if she shouldn't be part of like your, if she could be one of those people to help you um, to do this work. I know she's, this is, she does a lot of different things. I think this is not her um, full-time work. I don't think. Um, no. But, um, so that's a re like it's a resource. That's a bit of a resource um, need to be able to do it. I just you know I think we're asking the department um, to do 
something that yes, we know that the commissioner is supportive of and wants to do, but we know that it is like on top of your usual business. Um, and so I think it's important as we're asking this to have some kind of, um, we know that money doesn't solve all the problems, but I think that there's a resource and capacity question, you know, cause some of it is, I think I'd like to hear where it exists. And, you know, like when I've been um, employed or even like serving in the legislature, we have trainings and it's, we don't do them. You know, we're given time off from our jobs within the time of our jobs to do the training, like it's carved out. And it sounds like in, within corrections, given our staff shortages and, and everything that that's really challenging, like, you mm -hmm. know, doing it to carve out that time. Um, so I, you know, for me, this report or, or recommendations, it's, it's almost like DOC going back. I, 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 I loathe to think of the idea of having to go back through the 500 or so directives that you have, but that might be um, part of it. But I, it, you know, I just want to make sure we're giving we're we're giving you the tools cuz that you need because it's not May. We're in September and we're going to be back in a, just a matter a short number of months. This is going to be um something that we are going to be dealing with in the next um biennium as well, right Madam Chair? I mean, mm -hmm. this is about like how do we this is like a step and support of direction to have you do this work that you are that we all want to have happen. So if you can, you know, I'm from your talking today, I'm hearing a few kernels of where we could do that, but any, any areas, uh, I'm not sure if I'm, if I, if I'm uh, so facile with all the categories of work, you know, with, within DOC of like, where are some things that we should, where we should be focusing. Um, Cause we could just send you on a wild goose chase. Um, so I'm going to intervene here a little bit. So what I'm thinking you're asking for, what are a couple, three specific items that DOC and whomever can really look at and come back with recommendations to us come January? And then the second part of the question is really dealing with, does DOC do this on their own? Or, they, or do they do it in consultation with other entities? Or thirdly, are those entities at the table with DOC in looking at those two or three items to come back to us for recommendations? Is that sort of sum up, Sarah, what you were looking at? Well said. Well, yeah. Okay. So, Heather. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I think that... Um, with regards to the potential for resources, any area where we have consult that creates space for people to um, get creative about the learning is gonna be really important. And what I mean by that is um, the department is huge. So uh, those focus, if we're gonna pull in the community, focus groups and then the community are gonna be very important. And that's gonna require, that requires its, um, own artful strategy. And I think that there are some, plenty of consultants that are skilled in doing that. How that- um, I'm just gonna stop here. I think we have a different thinking of consultant. Um, what we usually do when we're setting up legislative, like a report back with an entity saying, you got to report back. We, we do a couple of things. One is it's the entity itself that will do all the work and report back. Another part is we want voices from the outside to be expressed. So that entity would reach out to cons in consultation with them and say, hey, give us some feedback and is this the right thing to do? So that's when we say to con consult with someone. That's what we on the legislative end in a report are referring to. The other option is some members of the advocate community could actually be part of the folks who are doing this look-see and report back. So it wouldn't be all on the shoulders of DOC, but they'd have other partners there also doing the work with them. And then that whole group can also consult with other groups. So that's what we're trying to get at. Sarah? And I think, while I appreciate the idea of reaching outside, like the community, I, 
I think what we're talking about is is a bit of a more internally focused. Is that not right about um, training and competencies and processes around bias? So, because I, well, I appreciate the um, what you're talking about, Heather, with having the community inform this. I think I think for this, what we're talking about, I think is more of an in, an internal internally focused. And it might be some of those outside consultancies, whether they're national or regional. I mean, in, within our state, we have some, like the Human Rights Commission. I mean, we have we have some resources that, that um, can help DOC. And in fact, I know that you're all part of this, like we have a big, there's a big group working with the, um, on, uh, impl on the data, the racial data, Mm -hmm. work that came out of S338. But this is a separate focus. I feel like some of those people might be some of the same players, but I think like Bo Yang um, um, could be somebody that we might want to hear from on this topic with the Human Rights Commission and and how they might be able to, you know, bring their, you know, resources without it necessarily being like an outside consultancy. Um, uh, but they're, that, that's what they're, that's what a lot of the work that they do. Is that what we're talking about? Like, is that yeah. So, it's, yeah, I apologize if I misunderstood. I can't, I can't see us doing work without, without those stakeholders, right? Um, or being one of them, uh, certainly um, with my role with the Criminal Justice Training Council as vice chair have been to and been involved in many discussions where um, those uh, stakeholders and advocacy groups and agencies have um, not just assisted, but also provided different lenses in terms of how you know how we get to, how we get to the end and the things that we have to have to consider. I probably can't rattle you know can't rattle them all off off the top of my head, but HRC seems like it you know absolutely. Um, needs to be a part of these discussions where I've already met with Director Davis, for example, um, a longstanding relationship um, with Aton in terms of his consult, um, Migrant Justice, I believe we've worked with for Criminal Justice Training Council, um, all of, I can't, um, I can't really, I don't, I couldn't really, um, um, I, I can't think of why we wouldn't make that part of not just focus groups, but advisory as, as well. If that's where, if I'm understanding you, Representative Coffey, that, is that what you're trying to, is that what you're getting at? Well, yeah, I think so. And I think with this, we're talking about, I think our chair can speak more to this, but I think in this, there are two pieces of legislation working there around, um, uh, around, police reforms and that this would be in connection and a lot of it's around some of them around use of force. one is around use of force and the other one has aspects of uh, training and I think our thinking was how we can um, include corrections because it's part of our criminal justice system so um, I think it's about getting a report back and so it's more about the mechanics on how we get that back like you know if it's and to do to do a report it is pulling together a series of focus groups for that's the way many of the groups work. And I'm, I'm acutely aware of that, like that we're really gonna be talking about what can be done in three months, right? I mean, or, mm -hmm. or unless we say something, I mean, cause we're in September now. So I think we wanna be, I, at least I wanna be kind of realistic about, you know, giving a support and direction, but also that we know that it's part of a, um, a continuum of some work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And that support and direction would not be the nuts and bolts. It would be sort of the <clears throat> 10,000 foot look. And this is what we're really starting to see or areas that we really should be focusing on. Because I think, you know, I, I go back to some of the statements that um, we've made this morning that, you know, the mission of corrections is really for rehabilitation and that um, security is a piece of that, but there's more to security than just the use of force. Mm -hmm. um, and that there is fair and impartial supervision 
and how do you define that? How does that get carried out within our correctional facilities, but also um, out in the field? Um, and also the statement that um, DOC really has the role of the implementation of the quality of a person's sentence mm -hmm. and time. And how do we achieve that? Those are statements that kept resonating in terms of what we need to say in our language. But that's the goal of what we're looking at and trying to achieve. And if we have a report back, I mean, I don't know if there's any other way of doing it, but it's just to get the thought process going and laying the foundation for what Commissioner Baker is really envisioning um, the culture change within DOC and legislation that needs to occur with that come January. So this is really the very, very top level of how we do this. Does that make sense? And does that make sense to the committee? Members want to weigh in? I don't want to put everything on Heather's shoulders here. I want members to kind of help give direction here. Anyone, Kurt? <laughs> when in doubt, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I saw your microphone go down before your hand went up. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm unsure of our role at this point. Um, I can see that there that that we're needing some changes, but I'm not. I don't know whether requiring DOC to do more just contrib contributes. I mean, even in terms of a report back to us, they're going to tell us the things that they've been telling us in, in committee. Uh, and, and what we want, what, uh, what I want, are specific kinds of things that we can as a committee and as our role as a committee actually um, have DOC do. And I can't think of things outside of um, resources, and, you know, just money, people, buildings, things like that that we can't, because we don't dictate policy. We can't say, uh, maybe we can say, pass a law that says you can't use certain holds in a prison either. Um, and the kind of, of use of force you can use in a prison, is that is that our role also? Is that the kind of legislation that we're talking about? Or that seems to me to be dipping too far in, but I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm not sure where we're going with this. I think, I think the issue is more, we understand corrections and we understand that it's part of the criminal justice system. And when you're looking at fair and impartial policing, you also need to look at fair and impartial corrections. And we understand that because we're immersed in DOC. Our colleagues and the rest of the world don't think of corrections until there's an issue that occurs, such as the situation with Mr. Johnson. Well, then should we be able to, should we be able to then mirror what the Judiciary Committee is doing with fair, fair and impartial policing and say, use whatever they're using in, uh, to, within the prison system? It may not transfer quite like that. Sarah, your head was shaking. Well, I, I think the mission of corrections is different than that of law enforcement. That's and true. so I That's think true. that I think we can take the lead from, you know, I think we're going to be, there's, there's a parallel process, but I think, you know, uh, we want to, we want to tune it to corrections. And I think there is a clear role for us about setting, helping to set a direction. Um, you know, we have a wonderful, interim commissioner who stayed on longer, um, but I think, and we've, and we're, um, I think many of us are, are really pleased with his leadership, but we wanna, and commitment to this, but I think we wanna make sure that this is kind of formal, there's a formalized process to move this along. And I think right now, um, Vermonters are asking us for this, um, you know, and as we're thinking about, so, so anyway, I would just say, I think, we can do something that is, 
you know, appropriate for the timing of this and, and, and maybe keep it pretty tightly focused um, and, and encourage the department to come back to us. I mean, I think we're gonna be looking to you to, to inform us, to help inform um, what uh, future policy, if, if it's legislative changes that we need to make. Um. Mm -hmm. Another question, Carl, a statement? Yeah, not so much a question, just more of a statement. I, I think there's there's a real opportunity here for us to um, use this opportunity. I mean, we have, we have an opportunity here to move the training, hiring, uh, supervision piece along in the context of this, because it's a big part of the, this issue of racial racial equity. And, and uh, so I, I think there, there are ways for us to do this that are separate from um, what might be happening in the, in the um, public safety world, um, more in the human services world. Uh, and it's just, you know, are, are going to be our job to figure out how to do that. So the question. Any, any suggestions? <laughs> well, that's what we're grappling. Today's this talking with Heather today is this is a fantastic first step. And our conversations with the commissioner, I think, also, uh, you know, we can build on all of this. Um, and it's not so much that and I, I I hear Kurt sort of, uh, you know, um, thinking about what our role is in this, but you know, our our. Our role can be that sort of broad, broad policy, and and to a, and to a certain degree, encouraging the commissioner and encouraging Heather and the front office to, um, you know, go after this stuff and and giving them the the uh, 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 you know being the basically the fuel to help them do that. I don't know if that makes if that makes sense, but I think there's a there's a fantastic opportunity here. So the question is, how, what do we do with this opportunity? Do we do it in terms of poor Butch has hung his head? <laughs> do we do it as having a report back to us? Do we do it as just making a statement and putting that language in one of those bills? Do we have an action or do we have a statement? The action is not going to be, we're gonna hire more people we're going to change the training like this because we're not at that level. Carl, did you have your hand up again, or did you just? No, I, I, I think the, I think what we do is we work with the commissioner on the package that he has talked about. But the deeper package really won't be until January. That's right. Yeah. So this, do we do something is... to to lay the groundwork for that? Yes. For those of us who are back in January, and I hope we're all back. Yeah. Um, this is uh, these are sort of uh, the the ice breaking discussions to start that process. Okay. And the question is, what's the best way for that ice breaking discussion? Well, we've only got what two more weeks to ice break. One. One more week to ice break. So I, it, you know, there's there, there's a limited amount that we're going to be able to get done here, but I think just having having these discussions is a big step forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Butch. Thanks, uh, Alice. And I'm firmly in the camp of Kurt. I, I, we don't need another report uh, that an interim report of, that shows whatever for a three month period. But what we need is to continue, encourage DOC to continue on the path that they're on uh, in some form to, to not slow their, their work down. Uh, Heather, you have what, 1,100 employees or something like that in DOC? Yep. That's a really big ship to turn. And we're talking about turning a huge ship with ingrained, uh, just ingrained culture uh, within DOC. This is going to take some time. We're, and it, nothing we do today is going to be visible by January. Uh, maybe about the 14 or 18 recruits that are in the next in the October Academy, that, that might do something, but this is a huge project. This is a huge job. 
But I think we just really need to make a statement and this is what we're looking for, or this is the progress we want to see or, or something else. I'm not sure what that language might be today. Uh, to, to, to have another report or have a check back, that's not going to do us any good. I mean, there's a bunch of semi-intelligent human beings sitting around this table that won't let this die. And, uh, and I, and I think, uh, I don't want to create more work for corrections that they don't need right now. God, we gave them enough work to do in S338. If I, if I may, Heather, um, I, I, there's a couple things that have resonated with me. Um, I spent a considerable amount of time with you in January. Um, I, I won't speak to whether that was useful to the committee, but for me and for our, our department, the opportunity to, um, to, to outline how our business connects to culture was extraordinarily useful to us on many levels. And so um, though, though there may not be um, progress in three months, perhaps you know, we, won't, we, won't, uh, we won't solve global warming, so to speak. Um, I do think that uh, the efforts of this committee to fully understand um, what, what it means and compared to where we're going, um, that times and that effort's not lost, that's not lost on me. So uh, what do we do now as opposed to where uh, we're solidly headed by January um, will be an important conversation for us if you're willing to have it. The, the other thing is the distinction. Um, I, I just feel a deep appreciation and respect for the distinction between where corrections is different than the rest of the system. And in the most simplest term, um, our customers stay with us. <laughs> they stay. They don't, it's not um, when you go through the court system, you are were, you were going to go and there's an end point that's much shorter there, there's a very short um, experience with law enforcement, but with us, you, st you stay. There is a relationship that's built, whether you want to have one or not. And that, I think, uh, to your point, Madam Chair, with regards to fair and impartial supervision, it's fair and impartial relationship, right? Well, there's going to be a relationship with the department if you're serving uh, any kind of time with us. And it's even the probation experience, that's still um, what I would call a stay experience, if that makes sense. And those are two, um, uh, those two points um, are separate and apart, um, not totally from the rest of the system, but I do think that that's where we're gonna have to focus a lot of our time. Hope that was helpful. Mm -hmm. Carl? Um, I, I uh, you know, I'm with Butch and, and Kurt on the, uh, and on the, we don't need a report for this too. I, I think in many ways we've got, we've got a jump on this with S338 and the racial disparity element of that. Um, and I think we also have a jump because of some of the conversations that we had with Heather back earlier in the year. We know from talking with the commissioner about his um, uh, dedication to changing culture and, um, you know, to Butch's analogy of the ship, I, I completely agree with that. And there are maybe going to be times when um, the commissioner needs our hand on the wheel or needs us to ring up the engine room to get some more steam made. But um, uh, I think, uh, and, and there are going to be times when we're going to need to comment on the direction that he wants to go in. But I'm, I'm, I think we're, I think from a policy standpoint, we're, we're headed in the, in the right direction here. And it's, it's just a matter of um, not like uh, Heather said, not letting that, or no, Butch said that, not letting, let, not letting that slip. So it's almost um, saying, that, oh, oh, hang on, Mary. It's almost saying like, if we doing the language is providing the intent language and the support to DOC to continue down the path of X, Y, and Z. Okay, I'm gonna to go to Mary first before you, Sarah. Okay, Mary? Um, Mary? I just think it's very important that 
with whatever our intention language says, that it says something fairly solid. Um, my concern is we have a commissioner who is in Trump. And, you know, yes, I would love Jim to be staying for much longer. Um, but again, we don't know what the reality of that is. And so I would not want us to put, which we wouldn't, but I wouldn't want just loosey goosey language to kind of act as though we're just moving along to the next stage of January. I think we have to put something that is meaningful and is moving um, the D DOC along to be continuing their efforts in this. Uh, because again, we don't know when we might look to lose Jim and have someone totally new coming in, and that could be a whole game changer, mm -hmm. okay. which I hope it would not be. But I, I think we need to continue strong in, in what our thoughts are going forward. That's a very good point, Mary. Thank you for that. Uh, Sarah. Well, I really appreciate what uh, Representative Morrissey just said, because that, that was those are where, where I kind of land um, that we need this language to be s strong, strong to give a clear direction. I mean, I think it could be as simple as I, 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 I would like, I don't want to let go of the um, opportunity here of having this direction or directive that we might give it to be almost like a a precursor to a report or something. I mean, something as simple as identifying the challenges and the needs um, within the department around some, you know, uh, bias training and grievance process, you know, to, to, to ensure equity um, uh, within our facilities, um, something like that. But I, I, think, I think if we don't ask for an action step, we won't get an action. So what you're saying is you ident we, are, we need strong language um, with Mary saying, you know, if there's a change at the helm, <clears throat> uh, there could be a different direction. So our language needs to be strong. We need to identify what the challenges are and the needs for that. And I just lost what the other part was. <laughs> you said Sarah at the very end. Sort of, it's almost like a vision statement, you know, for, for like around like, you know, to promote equity uh, for our staff and our, the, the people who are in our, under the care of corrections. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's some of that language that we would normally put in the findings section of a bill, but maybe, you know, um, I think it's, I think it's important here that we reinforce what corrections, what we know corrections um, to be about the, the focus on rehabilitation versus security um, mm -hmm. containment. So, you know. And I think also it was supporting legislation, supporting a package being introduced next session. Yes, yeah, to inform the package, yeah. Thanks. Would it be helpful to hear um, a couple of the bullets in terms of our, our own outline for language? Do you have those handy or it's not? It's pretty much, I mean, it's pretty much what um, I've been discussing, but, you know, from a stepping off place that our workforce will be diverse, um, that our organization will be inclusive, reparative, and restorative. Could you send that to Phil so that Phil can send that to us? Would you be able not, to do that? Ha happily. It's not lengthy, but maybe it's just a place to, um, to start. Yeah, which which respectfully we needed as well in terms of the various areas. In the end, what you know, what are we looking to see? We're looking to see a diverse workforce. We want our practices to be restorative, reparative, inclusive, and um, probably no surprise to you that our leadership is accountable, mm -hmm. and it's accountable to the um, the community, the workforce, the people we serp supervise and their families. That's very helpful, Heather, and I think it would be good if we had that written okay. for us. So if you could just put that in bullet form, very simple. Happy to. 
Okay. You send it to Phil and Phil can send that out in an email to all of us. Does that work, Phil? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Kurt. Um, yes, I, I understand that we're trying to get something out as quickly as possible, but we are probably going to be in session until the end of September and we will be still legislators until January. And there is uh, justice oversight and those committees still meeting. So I think it's important that maybe we, uh, after sometime late in September, get the commissioner back in and just keep touching base on these issues that we're talking about. And also keep, uh, keep an eye on joint justice oversight and you and Butch can raise these issues during that. I think that we just keep pushing at it and asking about uh, time, um, time marks or when they expect to get things done and whether those things get done. As long as we keep focusing our attention on it, I think things will get done, but it takes a sustained effort. And we're, we're legislators until January and I intend to keep bothering the, the commissioner until then. Right. Right. Other folks, there's some folks who haven't spoken. Do you want to weigh in at all? No. So does it seem like we have a path forward here, folks, that it's intent language and goal setting language and not a report back? Is that where we're headed? Okay. Okay. So, Heather, this has been very, very helpful. Thank you. You've always been very open and forthright with us. It's been appreciated on this end, and I want to thank you for that. I appreciate the time, and thank yeah. you. All right, then. Um, so for tomorrow, who do we have set up tomorrow, Phil? Anyone? <coughs> Excuse me. I just heard from Susanna Davis. Mm -hmm. He would be available for the first hour, 8.30 to 10.30. Oh, that'd be great. And if the chair would like, I can ask Steve Howard to testify for the VSEA. That would be helpful too. That'd be I great. I have not yet heard back from Anthony Marks of the Black Perspective, but uh, might be able to fit him as, in as well if he agrees. Do we have till 10.30 tomorrow? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay, we've got two hours, so that would be good. That's that sounds good, and and Becky will be with us too, um, and we can start working on some language. Kurt, do you still have your hand up, or was that from? I, I do. Okay, <laughs> I'm still I'm still concerned about Woodside. I know the Human Services Committee voted to close in October, but there's yeah. also. Um, I'm not sure what closed means, and there is uh, litigation going on that talks about the legislature closing Woodside. And I'm not sure what happens with the people that were, the residents that were at Middlesex, when they, how long they can stay at the psychiatric unit, or whether we're still talking about uh, tearing down part of Woodside and building a, a unit there for the uh, middle, previous Middlesex people. So I'd like to get an update on what's happening with Woodside. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, that was human services recommend to appropriations. So appropriations will make that, that decision within the budget, whether to continue funding Woodside um, or not. That will then pass the house. It will then go to Senate approves where they will weigh in. Um, so that will be the process. I don't know what's going to happen. I know that RIF notices were sent out yesterday to the employees at Woodside with the day of the middle of October. Um, in terms of our secure residential, I have voiced this myself in terms of really trying to figure out where the, the current folks who were in Middlesex, are they still at the Berlin Psychiatric Hospital where they've been moved back to Middlesex? Um, and just 
getting a handle on that one. If they can stay this long at the psychiatric hospital, why are we building a new facility? Period. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, is there somebody who knows knows those things? <laughs> Butch is saying yes. So what's? Well, I, I'm thinking Sarah Squirrel would have a pretty good. Uh, well, they're going to say build a new facility. Yeah, and I mean, the our, the expected conversation that I was expecting yesterday and appropriations didn't happen. Did not About happen. <laughs> because I know that the administration is pushing to put the secure residential at Woodside. So, and if Woodside isn't closed, then that delays the construction of the secure residential, which then means a couple of things. You've delayed the construction and you're waiting for Woodside to close or you're gonna put an option out on some land to build. Marsha? How much longer do we have before we'll have to return that FEMA money on Middlesex if we don't do something with it? I don't know. I mean, they gotta see if we have a plan. Right now we have a plan. Um, I don't know. I mean, <sighs> Kurt? Does the healthcare committee, uh, what, are they, what are they thinking about this, about Middlesex? I know that they want to replace it as quickly as possible. So therefore, therefore uh, build, they're, they're not saying that the psychiatric unit can be used or not. They're not weighing in at this point because their workload is focusing on other things at this hmm. point. Um, this is a drawback of not being in the building and having these hallway conversations with folks. And we're in a very short period of time with this session. I don't know where to go with Woodside. I mean, the decision of Woodside is out of our hands. It's not in our hands to make that decision. We're not the policy committee. The policy committee has a recommendation to appropriations committee to close Woodside. Now, does appropriations committee agree with that within their budget world. And what do they budget for Woodside? Our world is dependent on what those decisions are. So at this point, we're all sort of in a holding pattern. We know where the administration wants to go. They want Woodside closed and they wanna start construction on the Middlesex replacement at the Woodside land. So whatever commissioner you're going to talk to in the administration is going to say that. Well, let, let me ask you this then. What, what about the justice involved youth that would be under DOC uh, jurisdiction or custody? If there, if something happens, are we, are we as it's our policy regarding those youth, are we happy with them going to Beckett or over to Sununu and New Hampshire, or well, what do we think should happen to them? I think they're under the jurisdiction more. Of, they're talking about DCF kids. Yeah, they're under the care of the commissioner of DCF. Of DCF. And that's why the decision is in that committee. But they, they commit a crime. The judge says they should go to Woodside. Yeah, they're not under uh, the custody of, of uh, corrections. But we're still involved, aren't we? Because if there isn't a place, they end up in the prison. Well, you're talking about placement. There isn't a place. You know, one of the issues, if you, this is what I'm going to say, and I may get in trouble for saying it, but we're going to make a decision. If we make a decision to close Woodside and contract out, that will be a decision that will be made. But there will be situations down the road where whomever is taking care or providing the programs for the juveniles, that they will want a state backup. And what we're gonna grapple with in a couple years down the road is where is that state backup? And we're also gonna be extending the youthful offender statutes that will put more pressure 
on the public on the um, community programming. Mm -hmm. So we can see this, but sometimes you just have to let it play out. Okay. And I don't know where to go with Woodside. Uh, I don't, and that, and our Middlesex replacement. I mean, we could get in the commissioner of BGS and the commissioner of mental health and have these conversations. Um, well, we could look at it. our knowledge. It's not gonna change some of the direction. If it's not, if it's not under our, uh, um, if it's not under our DOC mandate, it's it would might be under our institution's mandate. Correct. In terms of figuring out about the secure residential replacement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sarah and then Butch. It, it seems to me we made a decision um, during the session about the facility uh, when we with the capital bill, and I guess I loathe to go back and undo some of that decision. Cause I think what, two years ago, we, we said that the replacement of the Middlesex facility was a top priority and the capital bill reflected that priority. And so there's money in there and we worked with our colleagues in the committee of jurisdiction. And to, I, I did, I'm not really in favor of second guessing that decision. Cause I, I I think it'd be good to get an update possibly, but I'm not, I'd like to see us move forward um, rather than unravel a decision that doesn't, it, this doesn't seem to be the appropriate time to do that. I, I think an update from the commissioner when we last had commissioner Cole in when he was commissioner, he said it all depended on some of the decision points that were just made yesterday um, as to how they'll move forward and um, it seems like now is a moment where things can move forward. So, mm -hmm. Butch. So the fate of the whole thing now rests in House appropriations and Senate appropriations, and we can talk about this all we can talk about it, but until they make a decision, we're we're stuck. I mean, we just somebody has to say to us, build the building, and. But and this is this is, I, I guess we have we'll have to make that decision after the appropriations committees are got the budget out. I mean, if there's no money after, you know, October one or whatever, then there's just no money. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's to say. I think that's a valid question to ask. That the secure residential folks due to COVID got moved into the psychiatric hospital, and how is that working out? And is that a possibility of going forward or not? Well, I, I agree. That's a, that's a question that we need to ask because mm -hmm. if we can, if, if we really dig down, find out you don't need that secure residential facility in, in uh, at Woodside's location, what's next? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. I guess that's a question we have to ask. And they're still there, I guess. I, I remember testimony from, I think it was Commissioner Cole, that the reason uh, they haven't moved back to Middlesex is because there is so much damage and they don't want to put a lot of money in the Middlesex until they figure out what's next. And I, within the next two weeks, we're going to know what's next. Right. But I would like to know how, if this is having the folks there at the psychiatric hospital in Berlin has been disruptive to mental health, uh, Department of Mental Health, and to move the flow of folks going into a step down and moving from level one beds. Oh, Marcia? I don't think opening Middlesex back up for anything's an option. It might be what we hear. So then, and it might not be an option to keep them at the psychiatric hospital, which then expedites the decision on Woodside. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to put anybody in those living conditions in Middlesex is sad. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that may be towards the end of next week, folks. So it's after 1030. 
Time to move on. We're on the floor this afternoon at two o'clock. Um, the other thing too, I wanna give you folks a heads up that the Appropriations Committee is getting some language put together and I ask for us to be notified of this when the language gets done in looking at our space needs for when we reconvene in January up in Montpelier. Um, it's very similar, I'm thinking, to what we talked about Tuesday with the Sergeant at Arms, um, you know, looking at the different spaces within the Capitol complex for committee rooms um, and making at least a decision there in terms of the space um, needs. So I'm understanding there may be some language in the appropriations bill in the budget that pertains to that. And I've asked that our committee can be in the loop when that language gets developed so we can take a look at it. And what I'm hearing, it tracks what we heard, as I said, from the Sergeant Arms and what they've been looking at. So that's kind of in the works right now, upstairs. Alice, when, yes. will, when will we be talking again about our um, CRCs um, in regards to um, the COVID language? I know we were all checking with our local uh, groups. When will we be discussing that again? I, th I think we made yeah. the decision just to keep I, I, just to keep the money as is in the CRF. Right, that was what I thought, but I didn't know if we were coming back to even discuss what we found out when we talked with our groups. Uh, I think I wasn't planning on having us come back, so to speak, unless you've got information you want to share with us. I was thinking maybe the information would go more towards Matt and Derek up at the DOC. Right, but how do they get the information if we're not? I mean, that was one of the things because I know we discussed that technically, you know, we were we wanted the language to stay in place. But uh, I know with the discussion I had with my um, CRJ here in Bennington is that they had put out their request for um, things that they needed through Derek, but then there's been no, absolutely no movement on it. Man. And so, and so how, how do we get there to be possible movement if the requests have been out and they're wanting to try to, you know, get the, the different things such as the laptops and, and other equipment that will you know, make life a little bit easier going forward in the COVID world. So um, how, how does that work? So I think Sarah can help clarify some of this, Sarah. So, so Mary, I heard similar things. And I think what we heard, what we, where we landed with Matt yesterday in, and in conversations with him is that he is going to work with Derek to, um, to bring that group together to, first communicate, there's been a communication issue where um, our, C, our community justice centers have put in these requests and they have heard nothing. So mm -hmm. I think, and they probably needed to say, thank you, we got it, we're working on it, we're gonna get right back to you, which didn't happen. So Matt said right. that he would do that. And he also made a commitment, there are a couple of them who didn't make re requests and we know that they're, and he, he wants to circle back with them to make sure that everybody has access who needs, needs some um, financial support with COVID related um, expenses. And also to make sure that people were including all the things that they could include in this request. I think there was a little bit of confusion about how these dollars could be used in comparison with their grant. So my understanding is that a communication, and, and it was great, you kind of asked for that, like a communication will come out from DOC to all of the community justice centers. So if we're hearing right. that they're getting that, we should, we should, I'm we can get in touch with Matt. I'm happy to help with that. I've been in touch with Jill Evans too to let her know where we landed so that she 
can help with that. She's she used to. Right. She, I I just like, want to make sure. I just want to make sure that it's a timely communication back and yeah. forth because. Um, you know, this does need to move in order for folks to get the uh, the necessary equipment they need to do their job. And um, and so I somehow, if there is a possibility, even within a week, to ask if someone can come back as to where are you with the communications with all the CRCs and um, and move that along so that that money doesn't just kind of easily say, oh, they can't use it and it can get shift somewhere else. Because I think if we're having these agencies in our communities on board, they need the equipment in order to do the job. That's a good point, Mary. And um, let, Marsha's has her hand up and Marsha was the other area that she was going to check in, I believe. Well, when we talked to Matt the other day, he said that these grants that he had, people that had requested would be going out next week. And he was going to email you and let you know that they went out and who they went to and how much they were. So he promised next week. So that's what I told my justice center. So maybe for all of us, we keep tabs on this. And if you're hearing from your local justice center that they haven't received anything by the end of next week, that we just individually email Matt D'Agostino and say, what's up here? Because my CJC hasn't received anything. Because I asked my CJC to make sure they emailed me next week as to whether they got anything or not. Right. So that may be the best way that we are the conduits individually for our respective C C CJC and then email Matt and say, hey, wait a minute, where is it? I'm hearing nothing's arrived yet at my, at my center. Does that make sense for folks? Yeah, yeah and, and yeah, I, I mean, that, that's great. I just wanna make sure that even the ones that we don't have a uh, jurisdiction over with our committee members that those folks were at least tapped as well. That was why I was just requesting to possibly have Matt or Derek or whomever kind of have a little bit of information back to us as well. Right. I'm looking at us. We got the state pretty well covered one way or another. For that uh sarah were you going to say something well, and i can also i i'm i'm can keep in touch with jill evans mm -hmm. this next week um because she has a view of all of the she's the kind of liaison between the 18 community justice centers and the legislature and i'm happy to i've been keeping in touch with her and making sure that this these dollars get to the places where we intended them to get so i can I can be in touch with you, Alice, if I hear that there are any wrinkles and then okay, that uh, works. How does that, I, in addition to the work that individual members are mm -hmm. doing? That works. That's fine. So anything else before we sign off for YouTube and sign off the committee? Anything else? Phil, you're all set for tomorrow. And then Tuesday, we'll start with Becky on some intent language. Anything else? Great. So thank you folks for tuning in and we will see you all tomorrow morning at 830.